David Joseph Perret, welcome to the podcast, man. Good to have you here. Thanks for having me, brother. Dude, uh, you and I have known each other for quite some time. I know I knew you were when you were in the Marines. Yeah. I knew you were, uh, uh, we ran into each other the first time, I think, over on Oahu when I was hanging out there trying to look for a place to move. Uh, I know you are a real estate investor. You were one before, and you've really blown up over the last few years and done a lot more. I know you have your own tribe, your own group, your own podcast. You've done the whole thing. But take us back before all of that. Who was David Prey? <laughs> I was the uh, the very typical service member, right? Okay. So I joined the Marine Corps in uh, 2008. I grew up in Little Rock, Arkansas. I didn't have money for school, wasn't a good student, wanted to travel the world. Oh, the military is a good way to do that, and I want to leave Arkansas. So went and did it. I was going to do four years, get the free college, and get out. Fell in love with it, and so I re-enlisted, re-enlisted again, and re-enlisted again. And uh, somewhere eh, seven years in, I was on recruiting duty, so I was working – just ridiculous hours. I mean, 90, 100 hour weeks and uh, kind of a thankless job where every month on the first, they're like, you had a great month last month. Now what? Yeah. And uh, so I realized like I was trying to figure out like, okay, what if I don't do this forever? And that's kind of when I hit like, I have no money. I have, you know, I'm like <laughs> negative net worth. Like I blew all my money on like the, the tattoos, the alcohol, the dates, the yeah. cars, the motorcycles, you know, whatever. And someone handed me rich dad, poor dad. Interestingly enough, they were trying to get me into Amway, and that <laughs> didn't really work out for them. But uh, so they handed me Rich Dad Poor Dad, and I was like, I don't read, dude. Like, books are not my thing. And he pulls a CD out of his pocket, and he's like, But you drive a lot. Listen to it. I'm like, Got me. All right. Called my bluff. I, I'll, I'll listen to it. Uh, and then within the next three months, I mean, I listened to probably half the Purple Library, and then I would I would go and I'd Google, What is this? Whenever I didn't understand something. And I found that there was this website, Bigger Pockets, that kept answering questions. So then I found your books. Nice. And then uh, I, I think I finished that book in August or September, and I bought my first duplex on December 28th. And uh, that was like proof of concept. When I moved out and got stationed in Hawaii, I was like, oh, this pays me. And that, so that was kind of the, you know, the, the start. Yeah. Let me ask a few questions about that. First of all, what, what did you fall in love with in the military? You know, from an outsider's perspective, I'm like, man, the military is like they push you. You have to work really hard. You're running all the time. Like... You're, it doesn't sound like a f thing to fall in love with, but every military guy, almost everyone I know, like has that story. They fell in love with it. Yeah, it's definitely not for everybody. So there are plenty of people who do their few years and then move on. I've not ever met somebody who was in the Marine Corps and said that they regretted being in the Marine Corps mm. ever in you know 15 years of being around people in the Marine Corps. And for me, it was it was the camaraderie, it's the sense of purpose, but it's it's for a large part, especially for like young men, it's, it's the travel, it's the adventure, it's the excitement. Yeah. Like there are a whole lot of things you can do right now for an adrenaline rush or excitement. You can go, you know, uh, zip lining in uh, Guatemala or whatever. Uh, there's not much that trumps the adrenaline of being like deployed in an interesting situation. Right. But not only like that side, I've never been closer to a group of humans in my life oh, yeah. than the 52 people that I deployed with. And like, there's just something about the, it's like the shared suffering side of, uh, camaraderie that you cannot beat. Mm. 52. Is that like, is that like how, like, is that a squad or what do you call that? Like, is that a, it's a platoon, a platoon. Yes. Yeah, so okay. We had, we had three squads in the platoon. Uh, I was in the first squad and then, you know, but so everyone kind of goes different missions. We, we were, uh, attached to a logistics unit. We were the, uh, security team. So like I was the lead vehicle for at, at 20 years old, I would be like the lead vehicle for like 80, 85, 90 vehicle convoys through oh. the desert. It was a, a lot of vehicle. That feels like a sketchy position <laughs> knowing that <laughs> it's not yeah. whether you, you, that's the one that we usually blow up or am I, yeah. am I making that up from TV shows? Yeah. You know, I'm not wearing a hearing aid, but I yeah. may or may not have found a spicy road bump once or twice. Uh, really? And, uh, you know, it, the trucks do their job, so it, it ends better than it probably could. <laughs> I see a road but bump. <laughs> the, Is that a thing people say? That's the thing that's Dave thing, says. That's the thing you say. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, it's, uh, you know, essentially the job is to navigate. And, yeah, you're right. If somebody's going to find something, and, yeah. and ideally you find it without finding it by, you know, via explosion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but you, if somebody's going to find it, it should be you. Yeah. Yeah. Wow, man. Were you, were you, that's a big question. Were you afraid uh -oh. of dying like did that make that like like was that did that cross your mind on a regular basis like oh i could i could not come home or do you just kind of put that aside and not think about it when you're deployed yeah i think that's like this whole reason ptsd is like a byproduct is you're in a state of stress and you like push everything like being deployed is like the simplest most complex thing you could possibly like so the whole time you're deployed is like there's there's no drama from home there's no dating there's no you know whatever there's no bills there's mm -hmm. no like you have one thing that you focus on. So it's like in that regard, it's super simple. 
I would say you think about it, but it's almost more of a like fear that you'd let your team down. Um, so ironically, one of the guys in my um, squad, and actually he was in my truck when we got blown up, is currently like you know submitting for uh, paperwork for previous incidents or whatever. Because what happened in, in 2010 is if you had like a concussion, it was like a purple heart like automatically. And you know, no, nobody really wanted to go through all that. But the real issue was if you, let's say you drive over something, you have a concussion, they would pull you off the road for 14 days to make sure everything was good. And so guys would like, hey, if I'm not gonna go back to the base for two weeks or for, for two days, by then, like, even if I did have a concussion, I'm fine. So I'll just not say anything. Mm. And that way I don't have to miss out on being with the platoon. So it's this weird dynamic of like, less scared of dying and there are moments where you have you know um a lot of emotions but more fear of letting other people down i think mm, that makes sense you mentioned the phrase purple library it's another one i haven't heard before but i know what you're talking about it's the rich dad series uh why did rich dad poor dad i asked the same question to diego our good friend diego uh, when he was on the podcast but why did Rich Dad point you toward real estate? Because like you, like, I love that you brought up the point. Like somebody gave it to you thinking you'd get into Amway. Like because Rich Dad Poor Dad drives people to different things, which is fascinating. Why did it drive you to real estate? Yeah, he talks passive income and and the lifestyle it can create. And he throughout the book he talks various different you know sources or ideas, and he gets the the blood flowing. I had been thinking about buying a house and even thought about buying a duplex when I first got on recruiting duty. And like so many people, I had pl plenty of people in my life to tell me why that was a bad idea. And then I was really busy on recruiting duty, so I just let it fall. I didn't know what to do. And so when that kind of came up, I was like, oh, well, this is something I've already looked into. It's not as scary. Like my thought, especially with like house hacking, which is the best thing ever, is you have to live somewhere. Like if you can find a way to – like it's not scary. It's way scarier to get into investing in something like index funds when you don't know what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And there's not like a tangible asset and it's it's like it feels like a risk whereas like buying a house to live in that might also save you money is way less risky yeah. in, in, in your head right so for those who don't know what house hacking is i know like a lot of people do but can you give a what what is that and how has that played a, a piece in your life oh yeah uh house hacking is the idea there's so many versions of this so there's the idea that basically you you buy a house where you can have other people help pay your mortgage so the typical is like a duplex or a fourplex where you buy you rent, live in one unit you rent the other and that's what i did on the first one uh, my second one was actually your idea i moved to san diego and i couldn't afford to buy there the va loan still had a limit and all that and uh i looked for a bunch of people i probably hit up 50 people on facebook marketplace like hey i'd love to rent your space I'll pay for, I'll, I'll sign a two year lease immediately if I can sublet on Airbnb when my family's out of town. And I found one person to say yes. Didn't mention that my family was gonna be out of town 95% the of the time. Yeah, <laughs> they were actually living in Missouri and they just visit occasionally. And uh, yeah, so I rented out the numbers on that. I, I paid 3000 a month and I made about 2600 on Airbnb. Uh, and I only had it occupied 50% of the time. So pretty yeah. cool. And then currently, a uh, weird example, I'm in a 4,800 square foot, six, three and a half house. And the upstairs is, like four beds and 3,200 square feet of that, my Airbnb it, and it brings in 3,500-ish on average. And my all-in expenses on the house are 2,600. The downstairs is a 1,600 square foot two one that I use in my office. So I've got my office and my you know internet and everything for the office covered by the Airbnb. It's pretty yeah, yeah, that's cool, man. Yeah, house hacking. Uh, I mean, I've been doing it since I was 21. I think I bought my first, even my very very first house at 20. I rented out all the bedrooms and then I bought a duplex. I lived in one unit, rented the other ones out and uh, have kind of house hacked the entire time. There was even a moment where a lot of people don't know this part of my story, but I lived in a church parsonage. So it was a church that a friend of mine went to and their pastor left and the parsonage is like the little house next door. And so the, the pastor had left the church and the pastor had destroyed the house, like just disgusting, like it was terrible. And they're like, well, Brandon and Heather know how to fix things up. Uh, so they asked me like, hey, in exchange for free rent, can you just live in here and fix the place up for us? We'll give you the materials. You just do the work. And I'm like, sure. So like even that in, in, a, in a weird way is I was, I was, yeah, house did, hacking sort of. Did you outsource it or did you do all I the I did all the yourself? work. Yeah, I did all the work at the time. Look at I, you. Uh, yeah, I had to peel up like vinyl flooring <laughs> and to paint inside, outside, clear away tons of brush. I feel like there's a, a lesson in there from yeah. old brand into new brand. Yeah, today I would have outsourced <laughs> that, I'm sure. But <laughs> But maybe not because like it would have cost me a lot more to outsource. In fact, the church probably got the best part of that deal. So maybe the lesson is find a young, impressionable, young 24-year-old 
and get them to do work for two dollars an hour because they will. <laughs> you know, I pay, I, they pay no taxes. Yeah, they, they, yeah. Where they'd yep. be writing everything. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, even to today, I live here in Hawaii. I've got a. I've got a probably three and a half, maybe $4 million house that overlooks the ocean, not on the ocean, but overlooks the ocean pool, you know, like nice property with two extra units, one downstairs, one in the back. And so I rent out the back one for three grand a month. I could rent the bottom out for three grand a month if I wanted to. My whole mortgage is only like 6,500, which means I live in my house for, if I wanted to for 500 bucks a month. I leave the basement open just because I like family and friends to come visit, but yeah. like my brother-in-law is there right now. I've stayed there before. Yeah, you've stayed there, yeah. So, it, and I keep it for friends, family, whatever. But the fact is at any point I could rent it out and now almost live for free in Hawaii, or I could move to the basement and rent the upstairs for five and now I'm making money to live in Hawaii. And so I just, I love the idea of house hacking because it eliminates the biggest like expense that you have, or at least reduces dramatically the biggest expense a person can have, which is their mortgage or their rent. Yep. And uh, yeah, super good way to get into real estate. Now, what are the benefits for a military person when house hacking? Like, how does the VA stuff work? What does that look for those who are maybe military background? <laughs> yeah, we do a whole podcast episode yeah. on that. But the, the, <laughs> suffice it to say, the VA loan is the best primary mortgage resident or mar uh, mortgage on the market. Like, there's nothing that beats it. I mean, the when you hear people say there's, you know, it's not competitive or it's not a good, you know, any there's agents and lenders that are always saying negative things about the VA loan, and it always boils down to they don't understand it, so they'd rather push you to a product they do understand. Mm -hmm. Because there's not a situation in which the VA loan doesn't win. It's lower interest rates, it's lower credit requirements, lower DTI requirement, it's um, no limit, it's got all kinds of crazy things you can do with it. You can do renovation loans, you can do up to four units, you can, uh, I mean, it. the list goes on and on and on and on, and the appraisal process is better than any other loan. So most of my lenders that I know have like a 60, 65% overturn of bad appraisals with the VA and like a 10 or 15% with any other mortgage. So it's, yeah, much better chance of house appraising. And yeah, it's phenomenal. Mm, love it. All right. So you were in the military for a long time. You no longer in the military. Can you walk me through that transition? When did you get out? Why'd you get out? Ooh. Yeah, I can try to, <laughs> I got out in 2021 after 13 years active duty. And I would sum it up as not fulfilling anymore. Okay. So as you get promoted more, you go from leading convoys in Afghanistan yeah. to working in a, you know, SCIF, which is a special compartmentalized information facility. Basically, like you ever watch movies where they like buzz, you have to like put your phone in the lockbox and you yeah. buzz through like six gates to get to your office and then they have no windows. Yeah, that was, uh, yeah. yeah. Two years of no windows, no range, no training, no fun. And oh, by the way, hey, you were going to go to Dubai, but you're good at your job, so we're gonna keep you and let the other guy go to Dubai. Or, you know, it just, and at the same time, the community's growing and the community starts to pay the same, if not more, through through that and real estate, like I'm starting to make more money or at least the same amount of money through my own actions on a fraction of the time. And I'm like, wow, I'm helping people, I'm changing lives, this is fulfilling, and it pays the same. Yeah. Yeah, all right. When it came time to come up, you know, to re-enlist, that was it. It was, it was time to move on. Now, I did do the reserves, uh, so I, I stayed around. I'm technically still in a version of the reserves, so if something goes down, I could join back up, but, yeah, who knows? Yeah. Well, walk me through a little bit of your real estate then journey. Like, you started buying real estate. What's that look like? Uh, how'd you get started with that? Uh, tell me about that. Yeah, we, the duplex, the second property was a, actually, it was a 10 unit that I closed the week we met, and we sat on surfboards with Mr. Nordman out yeah. in uh, Eva Beach talking about this deal. And it was, yeah, it was a 10 unit. Uh, it was 85% it was bank financing, 10% seller financing. And I had to bring $10,990 to the closing table. And then I sold it for 140 profit four years later to the day. Wow. So pretty sweet. Uh, and then I just kind of kept buying properties and I made <laughs> my share of mistakes along the way. I, you know, I did the, well, I mean, you know, you figure if, why can't you flip a house from 2,000 miles away with a contractor you've never met in person mm -hmm. and it just go perfectly. That's obviously everybody online says it's a great idea. <laughs> and uh, so $30,000 of loss later, I, I sold the house, uh, mm -hmm. not complete, and uh, it was great. What did you learn about, let's talk about that a little bit, long distance flipping. It is incredibly difficult. Why yeah. and what, what lessons did you learn? Oh, a ton. Uh, the first was um, not managing the contractor properly. I have uh, this wonderful gift of trusting people too much and uh, not wanting to call people out on things. And so if, you know, I should have had my, my property manager going by to check the property to hand him a check because I had my then wife doing that and she would just 
who wouldn't even go in the house, you know, mm-hmm. hand him a check. And um, he was at one point he was sending me pictures of other properties, oh, and it was like, but it was like the stairs, so it's like I can't mm-hmm. tell that this isn't the same house until I visit, and I'm like, dude, there's like a homeless person living in here. Oh, that's the contractor. That's not good, yeah. uh, and this thing's not got anything done to it. And then I got a phone call one day that all the materials got stolen off site. I'm like, great. You have insurance? Like, replace them. He's like, oh, it's on you. I'm like, well, then show me receipts of purchasing. Uh, like, uh, um, all right. So, I, you know, he just tried to, he took advantage of the fact that I was not really managing and I was just paying draws bit by bit without really verifying things were getting done. And I didn't have a way to oversee it. Um, so, you know, the military always says inspect what you expect, and I did not. That's yeah. Long story short. Yeah. When I look back, when I look at every flip that I've struggled with, every flip, I've, I've only lost money on one real flip, but every just horrible flipping situation or fixer upper fix situation, it's always my own fault of not expecting what I, you're inspecting what I expected. Yep. It's always me trying to save a hard conversation or me trying to avoid having to drive somewhere or me having to be the manager that I know I should of the project and just hoping things work out right. Like I love smoking that hopium. It's so good, right? And uh, you and I both. Yeah, it's so good. It just feels so good at the time, but then that hopium uh, lets you down every single time. Uh, yeah, so it's it's a good reminder of kind of Jocko Willink style, like extreme ownership. Like yep. if you take ownership of managing a project, it usually goes okay. It just I usually don't do that. I don't like, and so I've learned I'm not good at that. So Same. I hire someone else to do that. And then all of a sudden it started getting done well. Yeah. Started hiring project managers and they're like, they, they, they take care of that. Cause that's what they're good at. Uh, yeah. and that's been a huge lesson. And so even, and yeah. Alex on my sites, like, Hey, this is bad. Uh, go tell them that yeah. it's bad. Yeah, yes. exactly. <laughs> Cause I won't. Uh, my, yeah. At one point, my uncle actually told me, he was like, put a deer cam in the property so that you can watch them and tell them. And he's yeah. like, and if they have a problem with that, you've got the wrong crew. Mm. And I was like, that's great advice. And, and then I didn't do yeah, it yeah, because yeah. I was like, I don't want to do that. Yep. Like, uh, you know, I was, I've learned a lot about myself in that regard, but I'm definitely still struggle with the conflict side of things. So. Yeah. I don't like, I don't like conflict either. So how do you, how do you go through life as somebody who doesn't like conflict? How, how, how have you found to overcome that? Oh, I see. Is there a, <laughs> he keeps me in his life. <laughs> I was like, I see <laughs> the mic Alex. come up. Yeah. <laughs> Alex, Alex is my, uh, my bruiser. If he ever just disappears to Missouri, you know why. Uh, and he, and that's why he's in my life too. He's knocked okay. in. No. Um, <laughs> I mean, it, it's, it's, got to be, you know, contract systems, um, other people to yep. fact check or be involved in the process that have that no problem being a little bit more confrontational. Um, I have no problem, con- you know, if, the, if you like you and I had an issue, I would yeah. have no problem being like, hey, when you sit down and talk. But if it's like, you're like, I did a great job. And I'm like, I can't let him down. Yeah. You know, that's like my yeah. piece. Um, and then, you know, I'll tell you, my attorney has told me <laughs> probably three or four times in life. If you had called me sooner, mm. I would have saved you this much money. And yeah. so I've really got to the point of like, hey, Hampton, please do this. Yeah. Please look at this. Don't let me start this without, you know. And so that's another huge, huge piece of the puzzle for me. What's been your worst real estate deal to date and what's been your best? Yeah, the worst is a 40 unit or yeah, 40 unit mixed use commercial building in Branson, Missouri. Oh. 67,000 square feet, four stories, 15 uh, commercial spaces, 25 residential spaces. And what it was, was it was a lease option and it was a 2.795 purchase lease option, 150. And I'm not allowed to use the, the word scam. So I won't, um, <laughs> but it was, uh, not above board. Like we got yeah. in and the projected rents weren't what we were collecting. Yeah. And it was like, you have rent roll of this. And then we go to tenants and they're like, so-and-so told me that if I said I was paying rent when you guys mm. came by, like they'd let me stay for free until you got rid of me. And I'm like, mm. oh, cool. That's nice. You know, just yeah, all yeah. kinds of issues. And the the guy who leased it to me kept interfering in um, in things. And really, so four months in, I'm like this is absolutely not going to work. Like you either need to give me my money back or you need to do like tweak a bunch of stuff to make this work. And he's like, oh, it's not a refundable deposit. I'm like, oh, I paid for a Corvette. You gave me the keys to a Civic. Like, that's not how this works. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so four years of lawsuit later, wow. uh, we ended up winning on all counts, fraud and misrepresentation and all these things. And we got the all of our money back out, plus interest, plus attorney's really? fees, plus Congrats. damage. So that was great. But that was a, I mean, a great tuition experience, mm-hmm. uh, but a massive headache. And you know, again, when you talk going back to yourself, right? It, it all goes back to 
did I involve my attorney? No, I just used his. Did I, mm. did I, what I, one thing I didn't do was like when we got off the phone and we agreed to things verbally, I didn't send emails saying, hey, this is what we talked about, please respond to confirm. So there was a lot of agreed upon things that I had no record of other than the fact that I wrote it down myself, but he could easily be like, we never talked about that. Uh, so there was that. Again, I was long distance and I decided to keep his management in place instead of bringing my tried and true manager in lasted about a month and I brought mine in. I should have just used her right away. And so just a lot of rookie things. And and the other piece of that puzzle is I tried to go p- too big too soon. You know, I was in the 10X Grant Cardone world. And that at that point in time, I had 15 or 16 doors. I was like, we're going to go to 30 this year. And then I found a 40. I'm like, ooh, this checks the box. Let's do it. And so that was, that was the worst. Uh, Dude, there's something interesting there. And I don't have an answer for it. I don't know if you have an answer for it. But yeah, how do we balance that 10x mentality of like just go bigger scale you know go to the moon elevate your mindset you know don't be afraid with just the raw reality that scaling requires additional capital knowledge expertise stuff that you might not have yet so how do we balance that ambition uh with and with a healthy dose of fear you know yeah i think you partner with the right mentors yeah. and you give like That's hey i'll give great. you five percent to yep. be in this deal with me yes. run the numbers would probably be how I would try to combat that now. That, or I would, I love the shiny object thing, but I would say, hey, I've bought single family rental units. I'm gonna stay with residential rental units if I scale that mm-hmm. big, mm-hmm. rather than trying to also jump niche into mixed use, which, I mean, this thing had a murder mystery theater and like a wedding venue, a string quartet. Like it was super cool. I have no business yeah. pulling rent from a wedding venue yeah. when I'm like, I have. 12 tenants. Yeah. You know? So, yeah. yeah. That's a great point, man. Both those things is you expand, you try to 10x or expand, whatever you want to call it, double, whatever, outside of your zone of genius, of what you already knew how to do well. And then you didn't include mentors who could help you. I think the mentor thing is interesting. Anytime in a deal where I've, I've been excited about a, a deal, and then when I've thought I should bring somebody in, and then I get a little nervous, like, oh, what if they poo-poo it? Or what if they don't like it? That should be sign number one that I should bring them in. You know, like that would be great. But my ego gets in the way. I'm like, no, I want this deal. I'm emotionally invested in the deal. Yeah. And uh, this is about yeah. banks. Whenever a bank crushes a deal, I'm like, they were going to pay for it. It's good that they didn't They didn't yeah. think this was a good deal. Yeah. Yeah. I told that story before, but I'll say it again now. Is my only flip I ever lost money on, the one I mentioned, was the one that my hard money lender refused to do. The mm. guy I've been using for a number of deals. He's like, he's an experienced real estate investor. He goes, no, I don't like this deal. He's like, it's too, it's too risky. And I'm like, screw you. And I went and found another lender and I called 50 different lenders and I made it work. I pushed my way through that one. And that was the one that didn't work. And I've since learned that lesson that a bank or your lender is your partner. Like they're literally your partner. And if they say no, I mean, some might just be silly and have some other reason. But generally, if a bank says no, your partner says no, you don't do a deal. Yeah. Um, yeah. We're in the, the weird part of the market where you could have like the best deal ever. And, yeah. 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 And we're and a little think, weird. Right I think now. banks would probably say no to a lot, yes. but I agree. But there's a reason. It's also good to run. Why are they say no? Like in this case, the, and maybe I should, I mean, he, maybe this was the better answer in that situation with this guy who said no to me. He said he wouldn't fund it. I should have dug into it and just kept asking why. Yeah. Tell me more. Like, tell me why this one worked out. Cause what ended up happening, it's, it's, it's going to sound so stupid now that I say it out loud. But I mean, multiple things happened. One ARV, we just couldn't predict because there weren't many comps. So he would have probably said that, hey, there's no comps for this size of a property. Mm. But two, it was a 4,000 square foot house, which this is the obvious part. I didn't realize that a 4,000 square foot house would cost four times as much to fix up as a 1,000 square foot house. Mm. So I just blew by my budget like by like 4X. Because in my head, I'm like, I'd already done like 1,000, 1,200 square foot houses. And I'm like, oh yeah, 25 grand. Nope, like more like a hundred grand. You know, it's just like drastically different than I expected because it's four times as much flooring and paint and everything. And that's, yeah. And my lender probably could have explained that to me had I been humble and asked. Yeah. And I didn't. Yeah. Ugh. Uh, well, what, and, about, what and, about your best deal? I was going to say, and then the best deal is the one that I mentioned earlier. Um, I mean, I've had some pretty cool deals. Like I had a. I did a flip once where we couldn't completely agree on price and the guy agreed to zero down, zero interest and no payments till I finished flipping the house. Oh, wow. So I paid $693 in property taxes, renovated the whole house. And then when I sold it, I paid him the 38 grand out of the sale. So that was really cool. I like that strategy actually a lot. Yeah. It was, I was like, dude, I can't meet your number unless we do this. And he's like, 
I want out. I'm like, okay. Um, also went way over budget on it, but we, we survived it. So it yeah. was, it was a house with a fire and you know, new, new things, but that one actually turned out really good. Best before and after photos of anything yeah. I ever did. Uh, the best deal was that 10 unit. You know, I was into it for less than eleven thousand dollars, two hundred and twelve five purchase price, and it brought in forty eight hundred. Now it was class like F property. Um, you know, we had we had a lot of issues. Uh, it was it was one of those properties I would say you should buy or could buy very early in real estate when you have time and no money. But I would never buy it now when I have money and no time. Yeah. And uh, it, it was a good deal. You know, it did what it did. We bought it for two twelve five. We sold it for three forty four years to the day later. And I had refinanced at one point, used that money to buy other properties and it cash flowed not every month, but every year that I owned it, you know, there were definitely some rough months, but it cash flowed every month. And then it, I mean, you know, 11 grand into whatever that is, 120, 140 is not, not too terrible. Yeah. Congrats, man. That's great. All right, dude, let's shift a little bit. I'm talking about personal branding and, and some of the, the internet work that you've done and making money outside of. Uh, just real estate. So years ago, we sat down for a conversation, and somehow it came up about you that about the idea of starting a like a, a brand. I'm wondering, like, how did that? Like, why did you decide to go that route in the first place? I know we talked about it, but why did you decide to pursue that? Yeah, like, I, become an internet an internet celebrity. Oh yeah, that's that's exactly what I decided. I was going to be a guru, <laughs> and Brandon Brandon said so. I asked you how to write a book. Because when I was deployed, I had a mission log and a journal. And I was like, Navy SEALs and all these cool guys write all these books about all these things they did. But like, I have the everything I need to write a book about like what the normal people did in Afghanistan. Like, we, we did some cool stuff, but we were not jumping out of airplanes, kicking indoors. Uh, you know, we had our moments of fun. But So I was like, I want to write this book. And someday, I still will. I still have all the pieces. Um, and so I asked you how to write a book. You were like, write a thousand words a day. I was like, Okay where you're like start a blog dude just I was like okay uh what the heck do I write about and you were like you're in the military you do real estate there's a lot of people who do that but nobody really talks about it and so I started I was like okay fine so I asked Doug told me about this like five video series from Pat Flynn on like how to start a blog or maybe it was you who brought it up and uh, between you and Doug Nordman within like the first month or two I was like blog YouTube Instagram Facebook and then like a year later started the podcast I went to FinCon I mean at the time, I didn't even come up with the name of the website. I had like 10 ideas. I put them out on Facebook. Everybody said they were terrible. And a buddy <laughs> of mine was like, who's not even in the military, was like, how about this? That's really catchy. And so I just started writing. And what happened is I would write about things like the VA loan, like things I was learning or doing. And people would ask questions. I'd be like, oh, I got the same question three times. Let me go learn a lot about that and write about that and answer these questions. That way, when more people ask me this, I can just point them to that. Yeah. And I mean, that went on for probably two years. I had four or 5,000 people in a Facebook group. It was, it was good. And then one day the Facebook group went from like a hundred people a week to a hundred a day, 200 a day, 300 a day. And I was like, Oh my God, what do I do? What is this? And it was kind of then that it clicked. Like this isn't a hobby. Like I'd been in the red, you know I mean? I was paying to do that for the first two years. Cause I was just trying to learn and I was just trying to help people. And then one day I was like, Oh shoot this is a business. Yeah. I should probably treat it that way. And so a lot, a lot's changed over the last six years, seven years, no, five years. Yeah. Yeah. What have you, what value have you gotten besides money? What value do you get out of, uh, uh, out of blogging and having an online brand? It's incredibly fulfilling. Uh, the knowledge that you can, I mean, you know, I joke all the time. It's like, well, you could, what if you made $10,000 in real estate or you made $10,000 helping other people make $10,000? Like, in one of those, like they're going to be eternally grateful, great people. Like, I, I don't know about you, but I've not yet had a tenant come to me and thank me for letting them pay rent. So it's, uh, it's a, it's a little bit different. Right. And so the, it's so fulfilling to watch people that you've interacted with, take your advice or, or even just tweak something a little bit. And then, you know, they have a house that is going to pay for their living expenses or just, you know, whatever the case may be. Maybe they use the VA loan with a lender that's better and they save a thousand bucks on fees, even little things like that. So it's super fulfilling, but it's, I mean, it's just, it's just really cool to be a part of a community like that. Like they're, they're all, not all, but mostly like service members and vets. It's close knit and there's just getting out of the military is rough. You lose your purpose, you lose your identity, you lose a lot. And I think that's what really hurts vets when they make that transition. And I don't, I mean, it wasn't easy transitioning even with being like financially free and having a community, 
but it was a lot easier than it could have been because I had people to turn to. So that was pretty cool. Speaking of getting out of the military, how do we address and solve this problem of uh, military veteran suicide in America? Like, how do you, how do we fix that? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, and I actually have a really good blog post that I wrote on it yeah. once that you could go read at uh, <laughs> this URL. Actually, Alex uh, wrote a piece on it, I believe. I sent it to him at one point. I can't remember if you. Oh, is this the twenty-two push-up thing? Yeah, I was. Oh, we were, <laughs> we were pretty rude about that. I was. Or I, I was. I was. I was worried that this would bomb. So there's all these, you know, like twenty-two a day, and um, they mean well, they really do. Um, I don't think that drawing attention is a solution. I think. Are you familiar with contagion effect? Mm -hmm. So yeah. uh, it's like the idea that uh, I think Malcolm Gladwell talks about it in Blink, maybe. Um, it's the idea that like if you see something and it's normalized, you're more likely to do it. So like if somebody kills himself and everybody publicizes it or like a mass shooting and it's publicized, yeah. it becomes almost acceptable. So it's it's the theory for why when Lincoln Parks, uh, you know, he, he passed away that a year to the day later, there was uh, another, and I'm drawing a blank on the name, but... Uh, Chris I, Cornell, and how go. dare you? I'm sorry. Yeah, I knew. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, and it should never bring up music around Alex. Um, but it was a year to the day later, and the the only thing anyone can come up with is that it was the relation. So my, my kind of theory is go outside yeah. and find other people to hang out with, other vets or, you know, whatever, because it's like if you... If you, if you publicize this idea that it's like a normal out, it becomes something that's acceptable in your own head and it becomes an option when you're at the low of lows. Everybody goes through low times. But for some reason for vets, it seems to be like an option, which is unfortunate. And so my, my thought process is really just go outside, get around other vets, you know, find something that you enjoy and lean into it. I, I mean, it's not an easy problem to solve. I don't have the answers. But when I'm having a crappy day, I call a friend and I go for a walk out in the sun. So, yeah, it's good advice, man. Well, let's go back a little bit to the, the online business. There's a lot of people living, listening to the show who are real estate investors, but they're also thinking there's not a lot of cash flow right now in real estate. So maybe I need to do some kind of online business. So what have you said? Uh, what do you believe is like the key to success and making money on the Internet? Consistency. Mm. I, I think it's as simple as starting to do something and then not stopping until it works. I mean, don't don't get me wrong. There are. There's the whole, like, whether you pivot or you quit, like, there's there's a time to call it. Like, there are things that are just not going to work. But not until you've put in a significant amount of time and you're like, what in the world? Like, I didn't see any growth that first year, and I didn't make a dollar until second year. And I wasn't profitable until the third year. I was paying to build this. Yeah. Uh, so I always joke there's, like, this BMW phase, like the below minimum wage or whatever. I don't know if that's um, – I don't know where I first heard that, but – um, like, you know, that's entrepreneurship. Yeah. There's always that point in time with anything and everything that you start where you're like, that's funny. I hope this works. Although I'm not BMW. getting paid, <laughs> you know, and if you can't make it through that, I mean, it's the same reason for why 95% of podcasts don't make it past episode 20. Yeah. They just quit. Yeah. And they it, all could be big if they just didn't quit. Yeah. You give me, uh, you know, you've given me a lot of, uh, shout outs for for getting you into this internet marketing thing because i mentioned it to you but the funny thing is i mentioned it to everybody like hundreds of people i probably told yeah you should start a blog you're the only one i think that actually did it <laughs> like i don't think anybody else is actually that i can think of was like took my advice and then went out and did it maybe investor go brit but i think she was already starting she already had her instagram going i'm too dumb so to like, quit. yeah yeah <laughs> you're too dumb. it's like yeah there's something to you just do it for a long period of time. And I love that BMW phase. I'd love to, to harp on that a minute longer because there's this feeling that people get in, in business of like, I'm gonna charge what I'm worth. And if I'm not getting what I'm worth, then therefore I'm not gonna do that action. So like I would put in a hundred hours of work and I bought one rental property that makes me a hundred dollars a month. Oh, I'm, a, I'm worth way more than that. <laughs> and so then they quit. Or I, I've been doing a blog for a year now and I'm making 12 cents a day from uh, Google. Like, oh. I'm, I'm not going to continue with this. Uh, I, I recently heard, I think it was Chris Williamson from a, a Modern Wisdom podcast. He mentions, like, that's the guy that's like, 
He gets every big celebrity there is now. He gets on this show. Massive show, massive YouTube, massive whatever. Great videos. Great videos. He poured, he's the best when it comes to video quality. I mean, we're, we're chasing his uh, coattails right now, trying to figure out how he does what he does. And he said something that just blew my mind. I think he said, like, he had 400 episodes before he crossed a million, like, subscribers on YouTube. And I'm like, 400 episodes of his show. And again, this is like the guy, like the goat of podcasting right now. Took 400 episodes. And that's that's like a decade of work. Overnight success. <laughs> yeah, overnight, exactly. Overnight <laughs> success. Now, I first heard about Chris Williams in like a year ago. And so it would appear he came out of nowhere until he was like, no, I did 400 episodes. And uh, maybe people with this show, like this show did has done well from day one. That's because of nine years, never missing a single episode at Bigger Pockets, yep. and then the last three years doing two episodes a week, sometimes three. It's like you put in your work, but nobody sees that, yep. especially in that BMW phase. That's it. I think that's yeah. why service members do so well as entrepreneurs. I always joke about this, but I'm like, we're so used to doing like a 24-hour shift, standing duty, watching the paint dry for no extra pay, yeah. or show up at the armory at 3 a.m. when you could be there at 7 but you got told to be there at three. So you're going to sit there for two hours, three hours. And you're used to, you're used to putting in a whole bunch of unnecessary or, or maybe not unnecessary, but extra hours with no pay. So then when it comes time to do it for yourself, it's like, at least this is for me. Like it doesn't bother me. And if you're in the military, like you've got all the benefits, so you could start something on the, you've got very low risk when you've got a great job that you know, you're not going to lose unless you like get a DUI to go out and take some time to build something. Yeah. Where do you make your money online? Like how do you how do you generate any kind of revenue? Yeah, uh, there's a couple different ways. Um, affiliate marketing stuff, right? Uh, my two biggest sources of revenue right now are uh, the I do uh, agent and lender referrals through the Facebook group. So service members move a lot. They always ask for introductions, and you know I don't I don't blast it all over the place or market it or anything. I just kind of if they if they come to me and it's on the website, you know I'll make an introduction to an agent or a lender that I know and at least think is not going to hose you uh, as far as you know oh you should use this other thing and and you, you know i don't know what to do so uh, we try to help vets get in place with actual quality real estate professionals and the the i think now largest is uh, the the paid community we have within the group so i have a mastermind group that everything i do is open to everybody right like i you know the group is 80 90 percent of what we talk about is open to is applicable to non-service members too but that one group uh, we won't even let spouses in. It is service member and vet only. Um, mm. My own business partner in uh, one of the ho- uh, hotel I own is a military spouse. And I asked the group once, like, hey, can this guy join? He brings a ton of value. And they were like, unanimously, yeah. no, we only yeah. want. And so it's a super tight knit group of, for lack of a better word, killers. Mm. And uh, we love it. So that's that's probably the most gross revenue but it's also probably the largest expense so yeah. it's a great time it's the most fulfilling thing we do what do you what did you guys meet in person or only on digital or lobo yeah we do we do three calls a week uh vir- oh. virtually and then um you know so like one or two might have a guest speaker or member and then one's just like office hours I, I do you know ask me any things and then i split them into groups like accountability squads and then uh, we did a live event in missouri two years ago in tampa this past year and then this year we're doing one in uh, keystone in this the winter and one in San Diego in the fall. So okay. we're, we're growing into two or three a year. And what's the long-term plan there? What do you see that in the next few years? Uh, you know, we're just gonna, we're gonna blow it up, I think. Uh, so I'm, I'm hiring a community manager, client success. I'm, I'm finally starting to hire people instead of just thinking like, oh, what if I do the cheapest way possible to try to, um, so hiring some talent, growing a, yeah, the, the goal is to help 10,000 10, service members and vets achieve financial freedom. So, oh, love um, it. you know, we'll see how that, how that morphs over time, but it's a great group of people. Well, what's really great about what you've done, it illustrates a point that I make all the time when I'm teaching people about building an online business or an online brand. And that is, uh, and I heard the advice years ago, over a decade ago, I don't remember who first said it, maybe Pat Flynn, but the idea that if you want to build a brand, you want to be the cross point of two different niches or two different cohorts or whatever groups of people. So you have, you know, real estate investing and you have military. So if you were just like, hey, I'm the military guy, I can help you grow, like be good at the military. Okay, that's just so general. Everyone's like, I don't need help in the military. If you're like, hey, I can help you with real estate investing. It's just so general. There's so many people doing it, whatever. I'm the military, I'm the guy who helps military people invest in real estate. All of a sudden, oh, you're my guy. 
even to the point where you, I mean, you can get too niche. You can be like, I help military people who are into real estate and also, you know, photography. Okay. Well, now there's only a few of them, probably, Alex. Yeah, you don't want to. Yeah, help you don't want to. Yeah, you don't want to help that guy. <laughs> uh, but you know, like you can get, yeah, you can get too niche. But between two, between two cross points of large groups of people, there's massive opportunity. So you can be like. I'm the guy who helps people with g gay travel. Great. Like, there's a lot of people who are gay and there's a lot of people who like travel. You, you're the middle. You're going to get people to follow you. My brother would jump right on that. Right on that. Right. Bo okay, good. Yeah. There are, there's a million. So if you're thinking about how do I, how do I get followers? How do I get a fan base? Whatever you want to call that, an audience, a, a platform. I like that word. It's like, what can you be the cross point of two things? And so, yeah, I think you just nailed that really well is the military to millionaire. Like you even put it in your name. It's like those are the two things. I was real estate in your twenties, right? Before I was bigger pockets, yeah. it was real estate in your twenties. It was like young people real estate. Hey, that's the guy. That's my guy. Well, uh, I, I cheated on creating that niche because there was this guy who's telling me it's a great idea who helped give me the idea. So <laughs> you know, but well, it worked out really. It, it seemed to have worked out well great for you. Advice. I, it also demonstrates this point that. Uh, there's a great blog article from over a decade ago called A Thousand True Fans. Have you heard of this one? I have, yeah. Yeah, so the idea of A Thousand True Fans is that, uh, I can't remember who wrote it, Kevin Kelly maybe I think wrote it years ago. People can Google it and they'll find it. Tim Ferriss talks a lot about it. But it's like if you, would only, if you only had a thousand people in the entire world that cared about you and your cross point of niches or whatever, you can have financial freedom from that or at least have a full-time income. And he says like, if a thousand people give you a hundred bucks a year, that's it, just a hundred dollars a year, a thousand people, a hundred dollars a year is a hundred thousand dollars a year income. So he uses it to say if you're a band and you have a thousand people who like would buy whatever product you put out there, your CD, your album, your T-shirts, whatever, and you can make just on average a hundred dollars per customer. That's a hundred thousand dollars a year. And it, what's great about that is when you have eight billion people on the planet, can you find a thousand people that are in your weird little world? Like you know, like even very even photographers, real like real estate photographers who like to get in shape. Like if that was your thing, I guarantee you there's a thousand of them in America of real estate photographers who care a lot about fitness. Uh, so like- There's Alex, only one baby, there's, there's only you're, one. Stop you're, trying to be me. <laughs> you're not unique. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, the point being, I mean, Alex, you and I have talked a lot about this as you're thinking like starting a, when you're working on it, it's kind of like a, a group. I don't even call it mastermind. Maybe that's even too deep, but like a group for, the, the guys who make the guys like me look good. So the, the camera, the creative directors of uh, podcasters and YouTubers. It's like, a real thing. Yeah, there's, there's a, thousands of guys just like you who are behind the camera making us look good. Why not get those guys together? Because who else is doing it? Nobody is. Cross point no. of several niches. Oh, and that niche is going to blow up over That niche is going to blow up. Yeah, yeah, so. Everybody wants an Alex these days. Yeah. It's so true. Yeah. If you how did I get lucky? If enough. you knew how many job offers I got, you <laughs> <laughs> lucky enough. I stuck him with you. I was like, all right, no, yeah, no, you I get out of here. Yeah, <laughs> you should leave. Dave it's, asked it's me. He's like, Stockholm he's syndrome. like, what would it cost you to come move to Missouri? And I'm like, you literally cannot afford yeah. to get me to move to Missouri. <laughs> I mean, yeah, Maui's a bigger draw, I think, than Missouri. Maui does help. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Alex, we have four seasons every week. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so I love the idea of Thousand Tree fans. If you can pick your thing. And then find a way to monetize that thing as you've done. You can make a full-time living off of part-time work on the internet. Um, and it doesn't have to be blog. It doesn't have to be YouTube. It doesn't have to be podcast. It doesn't have to be mastermind. It can be any of them or a million other things. You can sell. I have a friend who sells crystals. Like she has an uh, Instagram account that sells crystals. And she talks about crystals. And then she sells crystals and makes good income off selling crystals. Like that's random. I wouldn't buy it. But there's a thousand people out there who buy it. Much more than that. So anyway, just encouragement to people who are listening to this is... Look at what Dave did. You can do what Dave did. It's doable. <laughs> probably, uh, probably better than how Dave did. <laughs> <laughs> well, what lessons have you learned in that that are maybe like, oh, I wouldn't do this again. If I was going to do this all over again, making money online, th I would do this differently. More. What do you mean? I would produce so much more content. I mean, I was consistent and I think I did. I mean, I've got a thousand videos on YouTube. Wow. Uh, some of them are shorts, you know, yeah. they don't really count, but because <laughs> it's a video of from sure. another video, but I've got over a thousand videos on YouTube. I would put that at two or 3000. Mm. I mean, if I had doubled and tripled down on content earlier, blogging and, and SEO and just really worked on titles and thumbnails and, and improved the quality, not just the quantity. I mean, it, it, sky's the limit with content. It scales infinitely. Uh, if I'd brought an editor in and a, and a copywriter in earlier, I think that would be that would be what I do. I would have focused on like, hey, this is what's really going to help. So I'm going to do you know outsource some of the other things and really focus on the part that I'm good at, 
and do even more content. Um, is, is YouTube where most people find you or where do they find you? At this point, probably the Facebook group. So we've got a Facebook group with 64,000 people in it now. Uh, so yeah. I'd say that's the main. I mean, I've got, you know, all the other platforms and probably quarter million followers around wherever. But uh, the Facebook's the one. Facebook does this great thing where if you have a Facebook group that's really engaging, Facebook themselves is like, oh, people like this place. Mm. We're going to promote it to people that are like the people who are already in there. And so yeah. it does all the work for you. It's great. That's that's fascinating. I do not have a Facebook group. Or maybe we should have a Facebook group. We go back and forth on that, Alex, all the time. It's like I don't... I don't need more things to do and more business places, people for them to find me. Like they can go to a million places, but there is a lot of value. I, I see the value of a Facebook group. Um, yeah, I gotta look more into that. Uh, what have you found has worked in Facebook groups? Starting a Facebook group, what's been your secret to success there in case people wanna follow you? you know? Yeah, uh, well, I have a 90 minute video where I actually dug into, I, I, have, really? I, get, I got this question a lot. Yeah. So I made like a 90 minute presentation in my mastermind that was like, soup to nuts, how to start a Facebook group, the settings you should have and everything. So wow. happy to throw that in show notes. Um, it, yeah. Did I get nothing out of it, but a YouTube watch. I, so I love it, man. Uh, um, we will definitely do that. So um, I, I would say the yeah. biggest thing is, is engagement community. If you keep people engaging, it will, Facebook will bring people back. So mm. good content, ask questions, engage with people. Uh, you can find like who the most engaging members are show them off every now and then I'll post like, Hey, this person, thank you. You were the most engaging person for the month of October or whatever. Like here's a, you know, sometimes I send them a gift card or something, but I mean, realistically, it's just trying to produce decent content and facilitating answers for people with questions. Awesome, man. Yeah, that's great. All right. So I want to move on and I want to answer some, ask some more questions about money, finance, real estate. Before we do, I want to get to this week's show sponsor. So one thing we do on the show, it's a little different is hundred percent of all the profits from each show and I'm profits revenue. Uh, from the ad revenue goes directly to a charity of your choosing today. So what uh, charity or mission or cause should we put the money towards from today's show? Yeah, the one that I've uh, really been exploring, uh, working with personally, and, and, and I think is they seem they have a really, really cool mission is Heal the Heroes, which is mm. you're familiar with aerial recovery. So yep. it's subsect to that. Uh, and they have a really, really cool program where they basically take vets and put them uh, on a island but put them through a program for a year to i don't want to say rehabilitate but like help them find themselves and their pers purpose and and everything and then they give them a mission and it's yeah. it's super cool i've got a bunch of friends that have either gone through the training are going through the training or um it's been really cool yeah aerial recovery and heal the hero heal the heroes solid solid group over there yeah very cool we'll do so and that said this week's show sponsor is Better Life Real Estate Funding. That's right, that is my mortgage company because I have been through so many bad loan experiences and uh, dealing with loan officers who don't understand real estate investors, our weirdness, our quirks, what we need, what we have, what we don't have. So I was like, well, how do we fix this in the future? And then I'm like, I'll just make my own. So Better Life Real Estate Funding is for real estate investors who want to either flip houses, they want to burr, maybe it's the initial purchase or the refinance at the end. Maybe you're just trying to buy a conventional, uh, get a conventional loan on a rental property. We can help you. Just go to betterliferef.com. That's betterliferef.com. Tell them the podcast sent you. All right, man. Let's. I'm going to do a, a segment next called Fill in the Blank. It's where I say a f something with some blanks in it and you guys got to repeat after me and fill in the blank. So number one, if I lost everything today and needed to become a millionaire again, I would blank. If I lost everything today and I needed to become a millionaire again, I would form a community and just help as many people in that community find what they want to achieve. And I know that sounds super like simple and cliche, but essentially like find something you're passionate about that you're good enough at. You don't have to be the expert, but good enough at that you can talk to people educated about it, find those people, pull them together and create a, a forum essentially for them to share thoughts and ideas and whatever. And as you go, just create more content. I think, I think with a cell phone, you can create a million dollar business. Mm, dude, great answer. All right. Next one. If I was just joining the military to set me up for a great financial future, I would what? Ooh, if I was just joining the military today to set me up for financial future, I would, well, I would not buy a Camaro or a Mustang okay. at 28% interest. <laughs> I would put 10 or 20% into my thrift savings plan. So while you're at recruit training, they ask you if you want to contribute to your, it's our 401k TSP and they have a 5% match and which is great. 
while you're at boot camp, they ask you, hey, do you want to do this? Great. The answer is yes. How much do you want to contribute? 10 or 20%. Because if you if you take it out right away and you never see it, you don't even know it's missing. And then every time you get a pay raise, you put 2%, 1% in there. Before you know it, you're putting 20, 25% of your paycheck in and you're still living on the same amount that you always were. So it doesn't hurt. In fact, you, if, if you only put 1% in every pay raise, you're living on more than when you first started. And that 401k will take care of everything in life down the road. If you do that for a few years, then you know your retirement is covered, which yeah. allows you to take risks when it comes to real estate or entrepreneurship. Because it's like, look, I'm in the military, so I'm not gonna lose my job right now. If I fail at whatever this endeavor is, my retirement's already covered. So I'm not yeah. I'm not hurting the end. And I've got the beginning covered with this job. So you can take those risks to go big. And I think that's, you know, you start using the VA loan to house hack and. And I mean, that's the beginning. Yeah, that's brilliant, man. I actually really like that a lot. I think that it's almost like you're playing with house money at that point. Yeah. Like you go to the casino and you win a hundred, you put in a hundred bucks, you double it, you make 200, put the hundred dollars away in your pocket because now like your retirement's covered. Yeah. Uh, I've, I've said that often actually early on in my career, I bought like one or two houses like early on. And I was like, okay, if I do nothing else my entire life, I've got a million dollar net worth someday. Cause it, like, these two properties or whatever will go up to over a million dollars. I'll pay them off over the next 30 years. So by the time I'm 60, or even at the time, I was like, by the time I'm 50, because I was like 20 when I bought them, or 22, I was like, I'll be a millionaire. So no matter what, I'm as long as I don't lose these now, as long as I can manage them, I'm set for life. That's it. And that adds so much freedom to your life, just knowing that. Yeah. So yeah, I love, I love that you said that. All right, next one. Well, let me think of a good one here. Yeah, here we go. The best tips I have for people getting out of the military and looking to transition into civilian life is blank. The best tips I have for people getting out of the military and looking at transitioning into civilian life, spend time before you exit the military figuring out who you are. Like really focus on your identity outside of the military, what you're passionate about, what you're good at, your zone of genius, if you will, right? Like where your passion intersects your, uh, your performance and I mean, getting out's not easy, right? So create a community of people, like just friends, whoever that you can talk to. Uh, it's not an easy process, but if you know who you are outside of the military, it'll be easier. If you have a purpose, it'll be easier. And you don't have to have all the answers for your purpose. Just have something that you enjoy dabbling in, a project, if you will, that is like passion, you know, your purpose, whatever. And surround yourself with people that are doing what you want to achieve. So, you know, find, find good people, improve your network, and just hang out with them and you'll be fine. That's great, man. I was just talking about this yesterday with a dude about how getting out of like his job, he was, I think he was a police officer and he was asking me like, what tips do I have for getting out and going into real estate full time? And I said, he's already kind of done the right thing in that he's shifted his identity or he's shifting it from police officer to real estate investor before getting out. Because what happens is people get out of something, whether it's the military, being a cop, uh, they own a business, they sell it, and then they that identity is dropped, especially for men, right? Like our identities are wrapped in our careers. Yeah. And all of a sudden you have no identity because you have no career and you're just floundering for years. Yeah. We've all known people like that. Terrible. It's a terrible position. So when you rebuild that identity or you build that identity first by surrounding yourself with those people, by becoming a real estate investor, I, the advice I gave the guy was start calling yourself, stop telling people you're a cop. So telling people you're a real estate investor until you believe it. Like, what do you do for a living? Oh, I'm a real estate investor. Oh, I also do, you know, I do some police officer stuff on the side. Like, just like make that your, and say it enough until you believe that, that my primary identity is a real estate person or is a whatever the thing is going to be. And the military or the, or the career, that's a, oh, that's a small thing that I'm just getting done with. Uh, I think that, I yeah, it. I think you, you hit the nail on the head there. So, yeah, you got to get around people first. Otherwise, it's, it's a scary spot to be in. Yeah. And if you don't know what to do, use your GI Bill and go to college for free while you figure it out. Oof. There you go. Boom. All right. Related to that, can you talk about the skills bridge program a little bit, uh, both from a standpoint of for military people, but also for maybe entrepreneurs who need cheap labor, cheap help? How does that work? How does that work? What's pros and cons of it? How does it work? Yeah, it's not slave labor. But it's like the next best thing. <laughs> yeah. It's free. So um, yeah, so skill bridge is this really cool program that the military has where up to six months prior to your exit, you can go and essentially be an intern for another company. And one of the stipulations from the employer side is you're not allowed to pay them. You can want to pay them all you want, but you have to sign something pre like, I will not pay this person. Um, you know, so some people give like a, a sign on bonus at the end of the six months or whatever, but it, you can go, I mean, they've got skill bridge programs. They've got one at the white house. They've got Microsoft, they've got, you know, Apple tech, they've got whatever, they've got real estate brokerages. They've got all kinds of locations where you can, Hey, I want to learn this skill. I can go here and intern for six months. The military is going to pay you 
and whatever pay you were receiving, your, your what we call TAD, temporary assigned duty. And so if you were making $3,000 a month in San Diego housing allowance and you moved to Missouri for your skill bridge, you're still getting the housing allowance. Now, mm. conversely, if you are stationed in Missouri to do skill bridge in San Diego, <laughs> like, uh, you know, you might be a little bit rougher. Um, but they'll pay you essentially to go do this internship and you're learning the skill. And at the end, the idea is you have a job offer if you like it and you can take it, leave it, or you learn a skill and take it, leave it. Uh, so from the employee standpoint, you get all this experience and you get to really kind of start transitioning into the civilian world before the final exit and, you know, be really, really prepared. And then for the employer, you get a usually pretty high caliber yeah. employee for free that you can train and there's no risk. Cause if you don't, if they don't get along, six months is up, they go do their thing. And if they're crushing it for you, you make a good offer and you've already seen them work for six months. Yeah. I mean, I know you like the intern model yeah. for hiring people. Yeah, so. I've done a lot of internships. I have not done skills bridge yet, but a hundred percent want to. And I always talk about, it. I just, I know there's like a, some kind of waiting period right now, or I think it's a little bit longer to get in right now. It's, it's hard to get onto their program now. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, but I think it's definitely something people should look into because, yeah, it's a win-win for everybody. So yeah, I've had four SkillBridge intern, uh, interns, and I was a SkillBridge intern on my way out. It's a oh, phenomenal program. That's awesome, man. Love it. All right, let's shift a little bit and talk about you are a father. you got a couple of kids out there. Uh, tell me about that. Like, What has been your successes with being a father, and where have you struggled? Yeah, so well, I had a stepson. Okay. Uh, I would say that's where I've struggled. Uh, <laughs> that is a totally different beast than biological son. Yeah. Um, there's just all kinds of unique challenges, right? Like, um, you know, the spouse needs, has to like help you get that in or, or whatever, because you've got a voice on the other side that, I mean, I feel it now. If, if somebody was to be my son's stepdad, it would be very hard to not you know, bad like, him. Yeah. that guy sucks. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. I'm your dad. Um, <laughs> you know, so like there's a lot of unique challenges that come with that way with that. And also there's the lack of the emotional connection. Like it's, there is, you know, there's all obviously a connection, but it, it's different. I'm sorry. Like it, it is what it is. Like you can try to paint this picture that it's the exact same, but it's not. I mean, yeah. I, I was there when Jack was born and it's, you know, I love that kid and I love the other one, but it's not the exact same connection. So it's, that has its challenges, right? Especially when you get to like 15 and you get into like full blown, I'm not, you're not my dad mode. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's uh, Andy's six foot one and I'm five, eight. So it's like, <laughs> you will, you know, it's, it's got its own uh, situations. The other one turned seven in January and he is too much like me. We, we did a parent teacher conference like a month ago and the parent, the teacher's like, he's really good at math. He's terrible at English and reading. <laughs> And he won't shut up in class. And I'm like, you're never going to fix yeah. that. That's me. I'm like, ah, you're screwed. Oh. And uh, it just made me laugh because he's, and he's like super like logical and you can't pull the wool over his eyes because he'll call you out on it and like tell you why you're wrong. And you're like, I'm impressed, but also kind of frustrated. <laughs> um, successes. And, you know, uh, I've not been super public about this, but uh, the marriage is, I guess we could politely say winding down. And uh, lately I've spent more quality one-on-one -on -one time with my son than I ever did. Like there were always other sporting events or other, ex you know, things going on, or uh, I had to try to coordinate with this person to do this, or this person was around. Like it was, it was very rare that Jack and I had like one-on-one -on -one time. And now it's like, when I have Jackson, my only goal is to create an experience that he's going to love, you know, whether that's going to my buddy's house and shooting a 22 caliber Gatling gun off the back porch or, um, uh, teaching him to ice skate or going to a water park or, you know, what, whatever the case may be. It's like, how can I do at least one thing this weekend or this Wednesday or, you know, however it works out where he will never forget that moment. And so it's, it's been really cool to see that. I mean, we're closer now than uh, we ever had been and he's, he's fun. That's cool. Yeah. So as somebody whose marriage is winding down, as you put it, uh, let's start with the kid. Like, what other what advice do you have for other fathers, maybe or mothers? I mean, could be either, either one that are facing the same situation uh, where you've got kids involved, and now all of a sudden you're not as you can't be there every single day because you got to share the time. Or, or how how do you what do you recommend for people in that? Yeah, I mean, by no means an expert, as this yeah. is the beginning of a whole new chapter. Uh, what I'm really trying to focus on, kind of like I said, is, is making that moment, that experience, as good as possible. So. Let's say I get them every other weekend and there's always stuff to do. Mm -hmm. 
So I basically take one weekend and I'm like, you're not having fun. You're working so that on the next weekend, you're not working. You're hanging out with your son. Mm. And so it's like intentionally trying to make every moment we do spend together as, you know, as impactful as possible. It's, you know, not bad mouthing the other person. It's, um, you know, being open about what's happening, not hiding it. Right. He's going to he's asking questions. He's going to be curious. It's life. Let him know what happens. Let him know it's not him. You know, we're um, we're trying to get him into a, a independent therapist to talk, just to have a third party kind of voice in there. Um, just because we know it's a rough transition, and uh, just love him. Yeah. You know, I don't. I I do my absolute best to never miss a evening phone call, and you know, always always say the good things, and yeah, make the make the time together fun. Is there anything that you look back on the marriage that you? would have done differently? There's a lot of stuff. Uh, you know, that's a tough question because uh, and there's a lot of interesting, I think, reasons that my marriage failed. I would not, obviously there are things I could have done different, could have done better, but I would not say that it's for lack of effort. So, I mean, I tried, I had to, I mean, Alex and I had <laughs> conversations about this for way too long where it was like, I had to get to a place where I could look myself in the mirror and say, I did everything I could, whether I did it right, whatever. Like I tried everything I could think of every bit of advice that I had been told, you know, whatever that is. Right. And I got to that place and, and I, you know, I got to a place where ultimately the decision had to be made to set a standard and say, if we're not doing these things to move the marriage forward, then we need to call it because it's taking too much of an emotional toll on both of us. And it is not what I want to set as an example for my kids. Like the last thing I want is, uh, I won't name him, but one of my best friends uh, grew up in a house where they're still married. And he's like, they never slept in the same room. I don't know that I've ever heard him say they love love each other. You know, like they set a terrible example of what marriage is. And I, and I've actually had that conversation with a couple of people who are in that situation. So everyone says like, you've got to keep the house together no matter what. I agree. I, I think that marriage is a very, I mean, my parents worked for family life weekend to remember conferences. They just retired 25 years running marriage conferences across the country. So I agree with that. There's a point though, where the example you're setting for your kid is, is not the example that he needs to learn from. Like, I don't want my son to grow up thinking that what love looks like is roommate ship. Mm. So yeah. Well, thanks for being honest about all that. I mean, that's a tough time. It's fun. Real fun. Yeah. Uh, I appreciate you, man. Um, Let's shift to the (laughs) next segment. Oh, now we have to be happy? Now (laughs) we got to be happy, man. (laughs) All right. Oof. Man, no, I love that we're, I I love that. Anyway, I asked you ahead of time if, if, if the topic came up, if we'd want to talk about it. And I appreciate you saying yes. I just, I didn't just spring that on you, but, uh, it's a real conversation. It's really happening, and it's happening to half of the people in the world. So it's not like a small number of people are, are having. I mean, I would say more than that. I mean, majority of people are having problems in their marriage. Yeah, and half of them are ending it. Like at some point. So it's unfortunate. Yeah, it's unfortunate, but it's happening. And so knowing how to navigate it and learning from people who have gone through it are going through it. Who are you know, it'll help those people. So anyway, I appreciate you. Appreciate you. All right, man. Well, let's talk about pivots a little bit. So your life's going in one direction and it pivots. So we're going to pivot to the three, two, one pivot. Uh, what are three books that have changed the direction of your life? First, I just have to know, do you, do you visualize the scene from friends with the couch every time you say that? I know. What is this? Tell me this. What? You've not, oh, I don't, I've only seen one episode of friends ever. Recording. It's, it's, uh, <laughs> you just pivot. They get stuck <laughs> in a stairway trying to move a couch and he's screaming pivot. Cause they can't Anyway, That's funny. No, but we'll we might, watch it after this. It's we hilarious. We might need to get that clip, that yelling, and then make that <laughs> cut it in every time. That, this is three, two, one. <laughs> it's it's Dude, great. That's funny. Okay. I love All right. So idea. three books. Um, I am. I told myself I wasn't going to say Rich Dad Poor Dad, so I'm going to just <laughs> do it that way. Um, I honestly, I think one of the most, like one of the initial books would be yours. The not the rental properties, Thanks. but the uh, uh, No and Low Money low. Down, yeah. uh, because that one and. Um, I'm drawing a blank, uh, invest in debt are both like the first two books that I ever read on like creative stuff. And I love the creative options for investing. Um, and, and no, I know you're going to come on the mic. So I didn't do it just because Brandon's here. Dude, 
you get to say these sort of things and you think it's a big laugh and then you leave and then I have to deal with this ego. <laughs> <laughs> this is not funny. <laughs> You're Why do you think I brought him on? I know he was going to take my book. Just take his knees Just out so he doesn't look down on you. There you go. Um, so, okay. uh, number two, I, I would say, and this is really, it's, it is and is not a life-changing book, is have you ever read Free to Focus, Michael Hyatt? I have, yeah. Yeah, great. so it was, there's a lot of books on time management. Um, you know, I love the four-hour work week, but that that book was probably, it, it tells it in a different way. And for me, it was less of like, you have to block everything off and manage everything and more of like, what do you want to focus on? Cool, get rid of everything else. Yeah. Which was really hard for me to learn coming out of the military where like you just do everything all the time, no matter what. And you just work until it's done, even if that means you're not home. And so that book really helped me actually start understanding how to run a schedule and, and make, you know, kind of a work-life balance. Uh, not that that exists, but for me. And then let's see, third book. Uh, you know, I read it this year. I think it's probably been shouted out before, but 10X is easier than 2X. Mm, yeah. uh, I'm in the middle of trying to outsource and hire and grow and, and scale all the things that aren't my zone of genius. And it's definitely, uh, it's uncomfortable, but it's helped a lot. Yeah, that's a yeah. great book. That's a great book. Love it, man. All right, next question. Two pivot people. What people have changed the direction of your life? Yeah, well, Alex is going to love this answer, um, but <laughs> I, I can't not say you because oh, there, thanks, was a, man. there was a conversation, a single conversation on, on base, Marine Corps base, Hawaii, at my house over dinner where I was like, real estate's cool. Now what? And I asked you a simple question, and it led to the largest pivot in my life. Like I, the, the whole brand wouldn't exist, right? Uh, cause that idea had never crossed my mind and I don't know that I would have known where to start or how to start if someone hadn't been like, go do this. So, uh, that one conversation absolutely changed the trajectory of my life. The other, I would say is a guy named, uh, Wilson Canada. He, uh, was a mentor of mine in, in high school and I uh, used to go to his house once a week on like Thursday nights and we'd go and just talk shop. And he was a wrestling coach at one of the local schools and he just a really, really, really solid dude. And he's always been there. So anytime I have questions, you know, it would be him and my dad all through like high school and, and to date, like when I have like real life questions that aren't your typical, like entrepreneur sided, whatever it's like, oh my God, this is terrible or this is great or whatever, like balance me on this. It's one of those two guys. Ah, wonderful, man. All right. And one pivot quote, what's a quote that's changed your life? Yeah. So can I cheat and, and I'm going to, I'm going to cheat. Yeah. I'm going to cheat. Uh, David Osborne came and spoke to my mastermind at one point And he said, you kill a lot more with a grenade than a sniper rifle. Mm. It's like the shiny, the whole shiny object. So the quote that I always tell people is like, everybody's heard Jack of all trades, master of none. There's a second part to that, which is oftentimes better than a master of one. And so for the longest time, I grew up in this entrepreneur real estate world where it's like focus, 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 shiny object. It's bad. And then here's like the most successful person I personally know. I mean, net worth wise, at least. And he's like, I'm all over the place. And then you look at Elon Musk and you look at like all these different people and it's, you got to focus somewhere to get to point A. But once you get there, like once you're at a place where you can explore a little bit, don't just hold yourself into a corner. And I've always been like the, kind of all over the place, you know, focus is a lot harder for me than vision. Yeah. And it was really, really, really good for me to hear that and like be able to let myself lean into that. Mm, wonderful, man. All right. What about advice? This is past, present and future. Okay. So advice to your younger self. Yeah. Um, man, I'm trying to remember the word that I, let's see. Filter. There's the word, Mm. the best word for it. Filter the advice you receive through the lens of a, has this person achieved what I want to achieve or are they going where I want to go? Uh, and the best example I can give for that is I use this one all the time. And, uh, if you want to become a world-class MMA fighter, your mom loves you. If you don't have a mom, somebody loves you, whoever that person is, put them in there. And the odds are that your mom is not the best person to teach you to become a world-class UFC fighter, but she has your best interest at heart. She absolutely does. But you're not going to go to your mom and be like, teach me how to beat, you know, whoever, Khabib. Um, you're going to hire Ray Longo or, or like Chris Weidman. Or you're going to lean into professional UFC coaches. They might not care about you as much, but they're the right person for that job. And yet for some reason, when we get into like real estate investing, it's like, I'm going to get into real estate. Oh, my mom said it's yeah, a bad idea yeah. because she knows somebody who did this thing once and it didn't. And it's like, great. But if you follow Brandon Turner and David Green and Alex Felice and whoever 
that actually is successful in real estate, you're going to be successful. It's like the idea that if you went to a gym where Arnold Schwarzenegger, like the gym from Pumping Iron where it's all yoked bodybuilders, yeah. you're going to get bigger. Yeah. You surround yourself with the people that you want to be like and the people that have already achieved what you want to achieve and just learn to filter the advice. If somebody gives you advice and they've got your best interest at heart, but they're not the right person to give you that advice. It's not speaking from experience in one ear, out the other ear and focus where the experience comes from. Awesome. What is something you've done in your life? like changed in your life over the last year. That's given you a better life. <laughs> uh, it sounds very, uh, counterintuitive, but I've walked away from a marriage. Oh, um, that's the biggest life change and it is, things are on the up and up. I would say outside of that, really just leaning into fatherhood and finally, finally finding it to believe what other people say, like getting past imposter syndrome. I think like trying to work into like finally leaning into like, oh, I am capable of these things instead of the voice in the back of your head, being a good father and just moving away from, I guess the real way to answer that would be moving away from negative. There, you know, there were things in life that weren't serving me and it's hard, but that move is absolutely improving my quality of life. Cool. Legacy. In other words, when you pass away someday, what do you want them to say? David was what? Really buff and good looking. <laughs> um, great father. You know, that's, I feel like that's a cop out, but that's, I mean, yeah. you know, I had a really interesting experience not too long ago and, uh, you know, it was like a kind of a meditative experience and, and the ultimate thoughts from that were that fatherhood and like what my son's going through right now is the absolute most important thing in my life. So mm. that and, uh, helping 10,000, you know, have service members and vets achieve financial freedom, which I think in its own, giving them that purpose and that financial stability will cut down on both the homeless and suicide problem. Yeah. So I want to be a part in that solution. That's beautiful. What are you excited about? What's coming up in your life in business? Man, yeah, I'm excited about a lot. Uh, obviously just growing the community and being around, uh, other people. I, I, I love, I mean, that can be, you, heck you've got, uh, you know, Alex and, uh, Tyler are both members of, and they're both great people. Yeah. Well, Alex is the jury's still out, but, um, <laughs> he's working on it. It's, it's, uh, there's some absolute superstars in there. And so just being able to grow that community and share it with other people is, it, it's so fulfilling. And so it's really cool. I mean, it's like, I kind of started this thing as like, Oh, let me find people that are like me to, to like, hang out with. And now it's like, I'm blown away as like the little guy in the group half the time. Uh, so I'm really excited about that. And I'm really excited about just leaning into the fatherhood and, and having, you know, the ability to spend time with him doing really cool new experiences. Cause he's getting to the age where he can go and, you know, have fun. Yeah. So yeah, it's cool. Very cool, man. Well, let's wrap this thing. Last question. Where do people connect with you? Follow you all that good stuff. Do you remember the link? No. Do you remember the conversation? Wait, Yes, I do remember telling you to do a URL that was like super yeah. fun to say on podcasts. Yeah, yeah. So the URL is thebestpodcastguest.com. <laughs> and that was I didn't a, know you actually did that. Oh, That's... I did. It has been my go-to for about 7 months now. That's so funny. And uh, yeah, so if you if you go to thebestpodcastguest.com, you find uh, you can get my my book download for free and then all my social media is linked right there. What's so, your book called? The No BS Guide to Military Life. Amazing. Thebestpodcastguest.com. So good, man. <laughs> Appreciate you. You're awesome.